Sorry, me on Global News in Zuma, Nigeria. We begin with Israel's attacks on Gaza schools intensify. Belgorod declares emergency amid Ukraine bombardment. Ilan Omar, critic of Israel, wins Minnesota Democratic primary. Japan's Prime Minister Kishida announces he will resign in September. And Bangladesh court orders murder probe into ousted Prime Minister. Talking Israel-Gaza war, over 100 people last week were killed after Israel hit a school in Gaza City, sheltering displaced Palestinians. At the United Nations, accused Israel of escalating attacks on schools. The targeting of Al Talbun School on Saturday during dawn prayers took to wide outrage. Paramedics at the scene described the carnage as horrific, with bodies ripped to pieces. Israel claimed that Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad fighters were operating from the school a claim that was rejected by Hamas. Israel has continually raided Gaza schools, hospitals and universities, claiming the buildings were used for military purposes without providing any proof. With several evacuation orders since the war in Gaza erupted on October 7th, schools have often been used to shelter closely 2 million displaced Palestinians in the besieged enclave. Under the 4th Geneva Convention, schools are considered civilian objects and should be protected from attacks. However, within a 10-day period in August, Israeli forces hit five schools in Gaza City, killing over 179 people and wounding scores more. According to officials, at least 15 people were killed and over 29 wounded in an Israeli strike on the Dalal Al-Mugarabi Al school on August 1st. Two days later, strikes on Hamama and Al-Huda schools killed 17 and injured over 60 people. On August 4th, at least 30 people were killed and 19 others injured after Israel struck Nasser and Hassan Salema schools in the Nasser neighborhood in Gaza City. Israel bombed Abdul Fattah, Hamouda and Azara schools, killing 17 and injuring dozens more on August 8th. According to reports, the worst attack in recent weeks was on Al Tabin school, was hit by at least three missile attacks. The United Nations Special Repertoire on the Occupied Palestinian territory, Francesca Albanis, condemned the attacks. Still on crisis on Russia-Ukraine war, the governor of Russia's Belgorod region on Ukraine's northern border had declared a regional state of emergency, blaming persistent bombardment by Ukraine. Vyoslav Gladkov said the situation in the Belgorod region continues to be extremely difficult and tense, Daily shelling by Ukraine's armed forces had destroyed houses and had killed and injured civilians, he added. Gladkov's announcement comes as Russia battles to push back Ukrainian forces in neighboring Kursk after thousands of soldiers launch a surprise assault across the border in the early hours of August 6th. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has said the offensive is not aimed at taking Russian territory but as a way to force Russia into peace. Russia brought war to others, now it's coming home, he said on Tuesday, as Kiev said it had taken control of 74 settlements in Kursk, advancing on 40 square kilometers, what, 15 square miles of territory in the past 24 hours. Russia, which has deployed reinforcement in the region, said it had halted the Ukrainian advance and that attacks had been repelled at villages about 26 to 28 kilometers, 16 to 17 miles from the border. More than 100,000 Kursk residents have been evacuated because of the Ukrainian attack. Gladkov said Belgorod had also come under Ukrainian drone attack and that while there were no casualties, there was some damage to buildings. Earlier this week, it announced it will evacuate people living in the border district of Krasnoyarsky. Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 and currently occupies about a fifth of Ukraine's internationally recognized territory. Over 10,000 Ukrainians, including hundreds of children, have been killed as a result of the conflict, according to figures released by the United Nations in February this year. Schools, hospitals and other key infrastructure have also been destroyed. United Nations Human Rights Chief Volker Turk last month urged Russia to end its coordinated last-scale attacks against Ukraine's critical energy infrastructure after a wave of attacks over the previous two months. Now in Israel Gaza war, Ellen Omar, Democratic United States representative, one of the Progressive House members known as the Squad, and an outspoken critic of Israel's war in Gaza, 
has won her primary race in Minnesota. Omar 41 successfully defended her Minneapolis area 5th district seat against a repeat challenge from former Minneapolis City Council member Don Samuels. In Minneapolis, where speaking to supporters, Omar echoed some of the themes of Democratic Party nominee and Vice President Kamala Harris's presidential campaign. According to Minnesota Secretary of State Atalis, with 216 out of 217 precincts reporting results, Omar had 56.2% compared with 42.9% for Samuels. Samuels had criticized Omar's condemnation of the Israeli government's handling of the war in Gaza, while Omar has also criticized the Palestinian group Hamas for attacking Israel and taking captive Samuels, has accused her of being one-sided and divisive. He also stressed public safety issues in Minneapolis, where a former police officer murdered black man George Floyd in 2020. Other squad members, Jamal Bowman of New York and Corey Bush of Missouri, have lost their party primaries over the past few months against opponents who had won substantial support from the pro-Israel fundraising group APAC. Bowman, Bush and Omar had all expressed opposition to President Joe Biden's continued support for Israel, but APAC, as of mid-July, had given just 25 US dollars to Samuel's campaign, according to data collected by Open Secrets. Nine representatives were once considered part of the squad, but in recent times, the Democratic Party has backed away from some of its more left-wing courses, such as providing government-backed health care for all Americans or defunding the police, which rose to prominence in the primaries leading up to Biden's 2020 nomination. Omar, who came to the U.S. as a refugee from Somalia, describes her politics as visionary, bold, and loud, and says she has delivered millions of dollars in federal funds for community development in her district. She argues she has paid close attention to her district's huge immigrant population, including Somalis, in part by probing whether large banks discriminate against citizens who are Muslim. Omar has faced criticism for anti-Jewish remarks with White House Republicans in 2023, voting to remove her from the Foreign Affairs Committee over a 2019 social media post suggesting that Israel supporters were motivated by money rather than principles. Omar has apologized for that post. Still ahead, female Kishida, Japanese Prime Minister, has announced he will not seek re-election as the leader of the ruling Liberal Democratic Party, LDP, in next month's party elections in a decision that means the country will also have a new Prime Minister. Speaking at a news conference in Tokyo on Wednesday, Kishida said, it was time for a new phase at the helm of the LDP and that he will fully support their leadership. Kishida had informed senior administration officials of his plan not to run, reports from Japan said. He was elected party president in September 2021 for a three-year term and won a general election shortly afterwards. But his approval ratings have declined sharply amid a major corruption scandal within the LDP surrounding unreported political funds raised through tickets sold for party events. Over 80 LDP lawmakers, mostly belonging to a major party faction previously led by assassinated former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, have been caught up in the scandal and 10 people, lawmakers and their aides, were indicted in January. Michael Kusek, an expert in Japanese politics at Tokyo's Temple University, said, and I quote, He's been a dead man walking for quite some time. Public discontent with the former Unification Church, which became apparent after Abby's assassination, as well as slush fund scandals and the slide in the yen that increased inflation pressures. Whoever wins the race for party leader will face a raft of challenges as they take on the job of prime minister, which goes to the leader of the party with the most seats in parliament. Kenta Izumi, the leader of the Constitutional Democratic Party, the country's major opposition party, noted that the issues which had caused trouble for Kishida has not gone away. Kishida, a former foreign minister with a reputation as a consensus builder, took on the top job for Yushahit Sugar, who was criticized for his handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Under Kishida, Japan promised to double its defense spending to NATO standard of 2% of GDP by 2027. This marked a turn from decades of strict pacifism encouraged by the United States amid concern about China's increasingly 
assertive stance in the Asia Pacific. Kishida visited the U.S. in April, when the two countries announced a new era in cooperation. In July, Japan and the Philippines signed a defense pact allowing for the deployment of troops on each other's territory. Talking judicial matters, a court in Bangladesh had ordered a probe into ex-Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's alleged role in the police killing of a man during the deadly protest that led to her ouster, according to reports on Tuesday. Hasina, who fled the country earlier this month following weeks of unrest, is accused, along with other top officials, in the death of a grocery store owner on July 19th, according to the report. The murder complaint filed Tuesday in the Dhaka Metropolitan Court is the first legal case to be filed against Hasina following her deadly crackdown on huge protests against government employment quotas that erupted across Bangladesh last month. Around 300 people were killed in clashes between students, government supporters and armed police, according to analysis. At least 32 of those killed were children, according to the United Nations Children's Agency. The murder case also names Hasina's former Home Minister, Azaduzaman Khan, the General Secretary of her party, and four former top police officers. In her first public remarks since leaving Bangladesh, Hasina on Tuesday called for an investigation into the heinous killings and acts of sabotage during the protest. What started as protests against the government's quota system, which reserves 30% of civil service posts for relatives of veterans who fought in Bangladesh's War of Independence in 1971, became a nationwide movement to push Hasina out. The violent response from Hasina's government only added for the fuel to the fire, even as quotas were rolled back. When the protests intensified, Hasina blamed the opposition for the violence and enforced internet blocks and an indefinite curfew across the country. In the end, Hasina fled to neighboring India, ending her 15-year-old rule and prompting jubilation on the streets of Dhaka as crowds stormed her official residence, smashing walls and looting its contents. The country's parliament was dissolved, dissolved and Nobel laureate Muhammad Yunus is now leading a caretaker government with elections due to held within 90 days. On more stories now, U.S. approved 20 billion U.S. dollars arms sale to Israel amid Gaza crisis. The United States has approved another 20 billion U.S. dollars in weapons transfers to Israel, despite fears that Israeli forces are routinely violating international law in Gaza and the occupied West Bank. On Tuesday, the State Department announced that Secretary of State Antony Blinken had approved the arms sale, which includes Boeing-made F-15 fighter jets, advanced medium-range air-to-air missiles or AMRAMs, 120mm tank ammunition and high-explosive mortars and tactical vehicles. Some, including the over-50 fighter jets, could take years to deliver while equipment like 33,000 tank shells and up to 50,000 explosive mortar cartridges could arrive soon. The State Department said the United States is committed to the security of Israel and it is vital to use national interest to assist Israel to develop and maintain a strong and ready self-defense capability. On the tank cartridges, the U.S. said the sale will improve Israel's capability to meet current and future enemy threats, strengthen its homeland defense and serve as a deterrent to regional threats. The announcement came as Israel prepares for expected response from Iran and the Lebanon-based group Hezbollah following the assassinations of high-level Hamas and Hezbollah officials, which have raised concerns over the possibility of a regional war. The U.S. has said it is working to avoid such an escalation. President Joe Biden on Tuesday said an Iranian response might be avoided if a ceasefire agreement was reached to end the war in Gaza, where Israeli forces have killed closely 40,000 people, largely women and children, leveled entire neighborhoods and blocked shipments of humanitarian assistance. Critics have called on the Biden administration to cover weapons transfers to Israel alleging that they make the U.S. complicit in the destruction of Gaza and are an essential source of leverage that the administration has refused to exploit in its efforts to secure a ceasefire agreement and the war, which Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has insisted will continue. Reports that Israeli forces are systematically violating international law and committing abuses, such as torture, have also failed to stop the flow of weapons 
despite requirements under U.S. law that military units credibly accused of gross human rights violations be cut off from support. United Nations Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, speaking from the United Nations on Tuesday, said her country's goal in the region was to turn the temperature down. In African sins now, Africa CDC declares MPOX as health emergency. On Tuesday, the African Union's health authority declared a public health emergency over an outbreak of MPOX whose spread has been on the increase since July. In an online briefing on Tuesday, the head of the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Jean Kasea, called for aggressive efforts to tackle the outbreak. As of August 4th, according to CDC data, there had been 38,465 cases of MPOX and 1,456 deaths in Africa since January 2022. The outbreak has swept through several African countries, particularly the Democratic Republic of Congo DRC. Nearly all East and Central African countries have now confirmed cases. MPOX is transmitted through close contact. It causes rashes, flu-like symptoms, and post-field wounds, although most cases are mild, they have been confirmed fatalities. The World Health Organization said on Tuesday that its own emergency committee will sit on Wednesday to discuss whether a public health emergency of international concern should be declared. On climate crisis, United Nations says flood in Africa impacts more than 700,000 people. According to a report from the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, or CHA, the floods presently affecting Central and West Africa have already impacted over 700,000 people. This disturbing situation is the result of torrential rains that have hit the region to just two months into the rainy season. The Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs is concerned about the flooding in the region, which has already affected hundreds of thousands of people. Just two months into the rainy season, heavy rains and severe flooding have affected over 700,000 people in the Central African Republic, Chad, Ivory Coast, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Liberia, Niger, Nigeria, Mali, and Togo, said Farhan Haq, Deputy Spokesperson for United Nations Secretary General, during a press conference. In reaction to the scale of the disaster, the United Nations, in collaboration with its partners, has strengthened support to the government of the affected countries. The aid provided includes food distribution, shelter and water and sanitation services. The United Nations Central Emergency Response Fund has allocated 10 million US dollars this year to the government of Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Niger. This aid is targeted at mitigating the effects of climate shocks, including floods which continue to threaten millions of lives in sub-Saharan Africa. We take a quick break and when we come back, stories from Nigeria. Welcome back. Now, stories from Nigeria. In a quick turn of events, go on up to Salami, Jonathan, others back to Nibu. Yesterday, the Council of State comprising ex-presidents and heads of state, the President of the Senate and Speaker of the House of Representatives, serving and retired Justice Chief, Chief Justice of Nigeria, CJN, as well as state governors, passed a vote of confidence on President Bola Tinibu's administration. This is as the Council of State has described the recent hunger and bad governance protests as an insurrection and a movement targeted at regime change. The former leaders that passed the confidence vote on President Tinubu included General Yakubu Gowon, Mahmoud Wari, and Abdul Salami Abubakar, as well as former President Putlock Jonathan. The confidence vote was passed during the National Council of State meeting preceded over by President Tinubu at the presidential villa in Abuja. Both former presidents Buhari and Jonathan attended the meeting fiscally while generals Gowon and Abubakar joined virtually. However, Chief Ulushagun Obasanjo and General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida IBB were absent. The governor of Kar State and chairman of the Nigeria Governors Forum NGF Abdurrahman Abdul Razak, while speaking after the meeting, said the council unanimously passed a vote of confidence on Tinibu on the way he has governed the country. He said the council was satisfied with the presentations made by ministers on the progress of the economy. The Minister of Solid Mineral Development, Dr. Dele Alaki, also speaking, said the council also praised Tinibu for resisting a forceful takeover of government 
And like he said, the National Security Advisor, NSC Malam Nuhuribadu, briefed the Council of State on the security situation in the country, especially on issues before, during, and after the nationwide protest. The minister said the hashtag and bad governance was not a protest but a movement and that the Council of State thought that nobody should be allowed to truncate the hard earned democracy and that any change will be through the ballot box and not by insurrection. He discovered that seven ministers made presentations to the Council on the progress being made on economy diversification and the economy in general. And finally, on the news, Tinibu approves 300% salary increase for judges. President Bola Tinibu has signed the Judicial Office Holder Salaries and Allowances Bill into law. The special advisor to the President on Senate Matters, Senator Bashir Lado, revealed this on Tuesday in a statement in Abuja. The National Assembly had in June approved a bill that grants a 300% salary rise for judicial officers at the federal and state levels. These followed the consideration and adoption of an executive bill transmitted by the President who sought to prescribe improved salaries and allowances as well as other fringe benefits for judicial officers and workers. The executive bill forwarded by the President was titled A Bill for an Act to Prescribe the Salaries, Allowances and Fringe Benefits of the Judicial Office Holders in Nigeria and for Related Matters. According to Lado, the extraordinary move underscores Mr. Preston's absolute prioritization of the welfare of Nigerian workers above all else just like he did when he recently put on hold an ongoing Federal Executive Council meeting to assent to the new National Minimum Wage Bill of 70,000 Naira. Ladu said the new act prescribes salaries, allowances for judicial officers to reflect the changing realities and consequentially amend the provisions of the certain political, public and judicial office holder salaries and allowances Act No. 6, 2002 as amended to delay the provisions relating to judicial office holders. According to him, among the salient features of the act include the prescription of salaries, allowances and other benefits for judicial workers. He described the signing of the bill by the president as a landmark achievement and a manifestation of his unwavering commitment to the welfare of Nigeria's workforce. A recap of major stories says Israel's attacks on Gaza schools intensify. Belgorod declares emergency amid Ukraine bombardment. Ilan Omar, critic of Israel, wins Minnesota Democratic primary. Japan's Prime Minister Kishida announces he will resign in September. And Bangladesh court orders more to probe into ousted Prime Minister. And that's all in the news. Thanks for watching.